With the dawning realization in April this year that the coronavirus experience could go on and on, much like Stephen Hawking, I've been searching for a theory of everything. Now, whilst I might have gone to the same college as Stephen Hawking, unfortunately that's where the similarities end. My intellect is rather more limited and my quest rather less ambitious. Simply put, what the hell is going on with long COVID? Is there a way of uh, pulling together the various different hypotheses, the early symptom presentation, and the uh, vast range of long tail symptoms to come up with a theory of everything? Well, with a little help from a couple of recent studies, maybe. Hang around and I'll try and do my best to make some sense of it. If you've been watching my films over the last eight months or so, you might have noticed that I've been sitting on the fence somewhat when it comes to the cause of the long COVID experience. We simply haven't had the evidence to categorically uh, form any kind of position, as there simply haven't been the studies. Now, before I go too far, I ought to clarify what I'm talking about when I use the term long COVID, as it seems it can be used to describe potentially a few different conditions. Articles like this claim it's the lung damage caused by severe acute COVID. Whilst there's no doubt there are long-term symptoms here, it's not the long COVID experienced by the majority of long haulers. And this is fairly typical in that the studies out there that do pertain to long COVID are from hospitalized patients, not the vast majority of community cases where the early infection was often relatively mild. And when I say majority, most recent figures put the number of long haulers at 300,000 in the UK alone. And it's this presentation of long COVID I'm discussing here, not the prolonged recoveries of those who leave hospital after pneumonia and ventilation, for example. In my last film, I discussed the three hypotheses currently circulating for the pathology of long COVID. That is viral persistence, uh, an inactive viral trigger, and a continued uh, hyperactive immune response. And I've previously not been a huge fan of the viral persistence theory. There wasn't any evidence for it, the balance of probability was against it, and other theories could cover the vast range of symptoms that long haulers experience. But good science is where you change your opinion in the face of new evidence. And this new preprint from Gabler et al. does rather change the game. And on top of that, this paper from Afrin et al. does what other studies to date have not. And that is link an established condition to the long-term effects of the SARS-2 virus. Let's take a look. I've spoken about mast cell activation syndrome in these films before, but never gone into too much detail. A quick overview. MCAS causes a wide range of unpleasant, sometimes debilitating symptoms in any of the different systems of the body, frequently affecting several systems at the same time. The cause is the inappropriate triggering of mast cells, usually a helpful cell in the immune system, which react to foreign bodies and injury by releasing a variety of potent chemical mediators, such as histamine, when activated. MCAS can mimic many other conditions and present a wide range of different symptoms that can be baffling for both the patient and their physician. Often there are no obvious clinical signs since MCAS confounds the anatomy-based structure underpinning the traditional diagnostic approach. Sound familiar? And let's take a look at those symptoms. This is pretty much a who's who of long COVID, isn't it? Fatigue, tick, headache, tick, brain fog, tick, anxiety, depression, insomnia, tick, chest pain, difficulty breathing, tick, GI issues, varied, tick, swelling, skin issues, muscle aches, tick, tick, tick. And these ones in bold are the ones the authors linked to frequently seeing in long COVID. So what was their theory? Well, mast cells express ACE2, now known as the principal receptor for SARS-CoV-2, thus defining a route by which mast cells could also become hosts for this virus. Mast cells also express many serine proteases, including tryptase, which are necessary for SARS-CoV-2 infection. This study offers a potentially important theory, which is supported by, firstly, familiarity across several thousand cases over the last dozen years with MCAS, and the theory that COVID-19 inflammatory illnesses may be due to abnormal hyperactivation by SARS-CoV-2 of the dysfunctional, likely mutated portion of the mast cell population, as opposed to normal activation of normal mast cells by the virus. 
Basically, the virus infects the mast cells directly, causing them to go haywire, resulting in the array of symptoms just discussed. Their conclusions? Hyperinflammatory cytokine storms in many severely symptomatic COVID-19 patients may be rooted in an atypical response to SARS-CoV-2 by the dysfunctional mast cells of MCAS, rather than a normal response by normal mast cells. If proven, this theory has significant therapeutic and prognostic implications. We're going to come back to this in a moment, but now let's take a look at that Gabler et al. study. This study set out to investigate the antibody memory response amongst 87 individuals at 1.3 and 6.2 months after infection. However, in the process, analysis of intestinal biopsies obtained from asymptomatic individuals three months after COVID-19 onset revealed persistence of SARS-CoV-2 in the small bowel of seven out of 14 volunteers. Yes, you heard that right. Three months after infection, the SARS-2 virus was still merrily having a party in half of these asymptomatic individuals. They conclude that the memory B-cell response to SARS-CoV-2 evolves in a manner that is consistent with antigen persistence. But let's dive a little deeper. Is this just remnants of old DNA or RNA, bits of wretched old protein? To determine whether viral particles were present, we used electron tomography to examine a tissue sample. Particles with typical SARS-CoV-2 morphologies were found, suggesting the presence of intact virions. They think that the continued antibody evolution they notice on a larger scale is consistent with the body's reaction to the presence of this antigen. Now, there are so many questions that come out of this. If half of the randomly selected asymptomatic individuals uh, still had active virus in their gut after three or four months, how many long haulers still have active virus uh, in their small intestine at seven or eight months in? Some of them, uh, all of them maybe. And do these viral levels decline over time? Are the evolving antibodies successful at neutralizing the virus? And if not, how on earth do we give this virus the boot? There is some good news though. The observation that memory B cell responses do not decay after 6.2 months, but instead continue to evolve, is strongly suggestive that individuals who are infected with SARS-CoV-2 could mount a rapid and effective response to the virus upon re-exposure. Basically, this might suggest that long haulers are unlikely to catch the virus again, for a while at least. So let's try and pull all of this together. Now, I'm very aware that I am sticking my head somewhere above the parapet here, and as a result, I might take a crossbow to the face. But uh, along with the acknowledgement that with good science comes the flexibility to about turn if necessary, here we go. What did you think was the answer to the three hypothesis question? Viral persistence, uh, inactive viral remnants, uh, and the uh, hyperactive extended immune response. Well, whatever you thought, uh, you were right. It looks like it could well be all three. I've previously broken down the early illness into two groups. There was significant debate about crossover and many people felt they had symptoms that fitted both of these categories. But ultimately, more people felt their early illness was described by nausea, GI and chills more than the classic cough and fever. That is to say, reading between the lines, long haulers were more likely than everybody else to have more of the virus replicating in their GI system than their respiratory system, or at least a significant proportion of it replicating in their GI system. And what happens if SARS-CoV-2 is replicating in your gastrointestinal system? Well, maybe, as we've seen in this Gabler et al. study, it stays there. Now, this doesn't give long COVID to everyone, as we've seen in this study with 14 asymptomatics. But if you're prone to immune or allergic responses, if you've previously experienced asthma, uh, hay fever or eczema, or indeed rheumatoid arthritis, as we saw with the data uh, in my last film, these groups are hugely more likely to suffer from long COVID. I said in my last film that these conditions illustrate a trigger-happy immune system just waiting for the COVID juggernaut to come along and sit on that trigger. And what does this study show? But well and truly, that uh, presence of the SARS-CoV-2 in the gut being the juggernaut sitting on these immune system triggers. So what happens when it does? Your immune system goes into overdrive, autoimmunity with autoantibodies attacking the body. 
the high prevalence of mental illness, one in five quoted in this recent study, perhaps due to anti-serotonin antibodies previously associated with ME and CFS. And yes, if Afrin et al are right, in long haulers a disproportionate amount of mast cells have gone rogue due to viral infection, and the others are also inappropriately activated as a heightened immune response. And so, here's our huge range of system-crossing symptoms, where no two long haulers present exactly alike. And yes, those presenting with POTS or dysautonomia, a malfunctioning immune system can also mimic those symptoms too. Now, of course, this is a simplification. The immune system is complicated, and this doesn't take into account uh, long haulers who've got organ damage who will present a whole new set of symptoms based upon that damage alone. But I think it does cover the engine of disease that we're seeing in the majority of long haulers. It makes more sense to me than anything else has done in the last eight months. There's also been something niggling at me for a long time now. When I describe long COVID to people, often you get the response, uh, oh, it's just post-viral fatigue, it's ME, CFS, we've seen those conditions before, this is nothing new. Uh, but it's not. I should know because I've had both. I know what they both feel like. I had post-viral fatigue for a year after, uh, after glandular fever back in 2000, and I know what that felt like. It was pretty bad. But long COVID is different. It is worse. So, if this theory of everything holds any water, where does it leave us? The most pressing issue to come out of the Gabler et al. study is that we need more research. We need to get 100 long haulers together and using immunofluorescence, electron tomography or PCR, test them for viral persistence in the gut. Will we see it in less than 50%, the same as the asymptomatic group, or more? And then if we find some persistent virus, the big question is, how do we get rid of it? Will the upcoming vaccine send it packing? Great news on the Pfizer uh, PR release, by the way. Or could a vaccine just trigger more autoimmune issues? Well, we don't know, but subject to the completion of phase three trials, if you offered me a shot uh, of the vaccine now, I would gladly take it. But what can we do in the meantime? Well, the good news about mast cell activation syndrome is that there are plenty of treatments available for it, and a bunch of them are natural or available over the counter. You don't have to be pumping yourself full of corticosteroids to try and put a break on the immune system. I'm not normally a fan of health web pages that look anything like this, but Bruce Hoffman is legit and there's some good advice here. Taking some antihistamines and quercetin isn't going to do you any harm, and if your GP is prepared to prescribe some mast cell inhibitors like Montelukast, all the better. So for the moment we just have to get on with our lives, pacing our efforts as best we can, and wait patiently for the research to either make me look very clever or very dumb. Till next time.